Faith requires that we be a light to the world, and that means we can't hide in the dark. Today, Pastor Lemming challenges us to step out of the shadows. Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 50. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are here. We are in your midst. We have been singing your praises and thinking about following you. Lord, now we come to hear your word from heaven. Lord, this is your word. I trust that everything I say today will be substantiated, supported, will be the foundation. The word will be the foundation of all that I have to say today. And I pray, Lord, that we will be challenged. We will be challenged to step out of the shadows into the light. Lord, this world desperately needs Christians who stop hiding, stop being afraid, and start standing as the light you intended them to be in the world in which we live. Speak to our hearts today, I pray, O Lord. In your name, amen. I want to introduce to you a man, actually two men, but one of them more prominent than the other in what I want to say to you today. And I want to do so by just giving you some of the facts and the details that come not just from the Gospel of Luke, but from all four of the Gospels about this particular man. We begin with his name. His name is Joseph. He's usually termed as Joseph of Arimathea. That's important detail. There are at least 10 men named Joseph that are mentioned in the Bible. And so when you're trying to distinguish what Joseph you're talking about, you assign it some additional phrase or some additional thought in order to be able to distinguish that individual. This particular Joseph is mentioned in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all make mention of this man. They all make mention of what he does when it comes to the crucifixion of Christ. And his name is Joseph. His town is the town of Arimathea. We don't know exactly where Arimathea is today. Eusebius, who was an early church father, associated Arimathea with a town named Rama. That town is also known as Ramathim Zophim. And that may be where it was. That would be north of Jerusalem by a number of miles. And that may be the place where this man was from. What we do know is that the city where he lived was a city of the Jews. That is specifically mentioned in verse 51 in the middle of the verse when it mentions that he was from Arimathea, it says, a city of the Jews. Why would that be important? Now, the answer to that is because in Israel, there were encampments of Gentiles in different areas, and he was not from any of those Gentile encampments. He was not from Samaria. He was from a Jewish town. He had a Jewish heritage. He had a Jewish upbringing. He knew the Jewish faith, and he knew the Jewish prophecies. And his city was Arimathea. He is not called rich here in this particular text that I've read to you, but in the Gospel of Matthew, it says that he was a rich man. We don't know exactly how he became wealthy. It's often true that it was family wealth that was handed down from one generation to the next. But it may be as well that his wealth is something that he had earned, something that he had worked for in his business, that he had been able to amass for himself a relative fortune that bought for him 
power, even with Pilate, to be able to ask for the body of Jesus. But you begin to see this wealth being worked out in this story because here is a man who has a tomb, a piece of property that has a hillside, a rock hillside, and hewn back into that rock is a tomb that has been cut. Matthew says that Joseph himself had cut that tomb. That is an indicator that this was a wealthy man. Most people were buried in shallow graves, or they were buried in family tombs somewhere, like family cemeteries somewhere. But here is a man who owns a grave where his body is to be laid at some point. It's his tomb. It belongs to him. And that's an indicator of the wealth that this man had, that he could buy a piece of property that had a place for a tomb like this. It also says that when he came for the burial of Jesus, that he came with fine linen and a very expensive material. He didn't bring something that was a leftover at the house. It wasn't something that was used for other things. Uh, This was something that was very fine and very expensive, and he had brought it this day for the purpose of the burial of Jesus Christ. And it would have taken somebody of means to be able to have this kind of material. Most of the time, the bodies of criminals were simply discarded at the city dump, and they were left there to either be burned in the fire or to be the food of the wild animals. And Noticing that he's a rich man, I want to stop and say that there's nothing wrong with possessing riches. If you're one of those who does so, you should thank the Lord for his provision and his gift to you. Abraham was a rich man. Job was a rich man. David was a rich man. Solomon was a rich man. There are a number of people in the Bible who have been able to amass for themselves large sums of money so that they could be considered wealthy. The problem isn't with having wealth, it's when wealth has you. And when you begin to lust after wealth, and the love of money, uh, the Apostle Paul said, is the root of all kinds of evil. When you begin to dream, I mean literally dream, to the place that you're willing to spend money on a lottery ticket for a billion dollar win, which is little more than a recessive tax on other people and especially on the poor. You're lusting after something. You're loving something, and it has you rather than you have it. You notice in the passage we read his association. In verse 50, he's called a council member, a council member. That means that he belonged to what is called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a religious or was the religious ruling body of the day amongst the Jews. Uh, These were the people before whom you would bring your cases, and they would decide the case, usually the capital cases most often, sometimes the civil cases. Uh, The Sanhedrin was made up of 70 men plus one, the high priest. And so there were 71 total In some of the outlying areas where the Jewish people lived, other cities where they lived, they had what was called the Lesser Sanhedrin, a smaller number of men who carried out this same task that the larger body did in and around Jerusalem. This body of 70 men plus the high priest takes us all the way back to the life of Moses, 1,500 years before Jesus. Back in the book of Numbers, if you want to turn back there for just a moment, Moses is overwhelmed with the responsibility that's been placed on him to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, through the desert, and ultimately to take them to the very precipice of the land of promise. And these are uh, stiff-necked people sometimes. They are complaining and grumbling kinds of people and Moses is just simply spent. He's he's overwhelmed by them. And God provides a solution to him. You'll notice in verse 10 of chapter 11, then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. Verse 11, so Moses said to the Lord, why have you afflicted your servant? He's talking to God now. 
And why have I found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Did I, did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where I am to get meat to give to, where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my wretchedness. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you. I will take of the spirit that is upon you, and will put the same upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you, may, you not, may not bear it yourself alone. And that becomes the root of what is in Jesus' day called the Sanhedrin. One detail for you to remember is that it took as few as 23 members of the Sanhedrin to try a capital case. So when the scripture tells us that Jesus came before the Sanhedrin and he was tried before the Sanhedrin and then was sentenced to death and sent off to the Romans to be ultimately crucified, as few as 23 could have been involved in the making of that decision, and that's important. Because Joseph, it says here in verse 51, had not consented to their decision and deed. Joseph apparently was not there when that council meeting took place and he did not cast a vote for the crucifixion of Jesus to go forward. Another man who apparently was not there that we'll meet in a few minutes is a man named Nicodemus. And so you see that he's from a very powerful body of people. He's described here in his character, he's called a good and a just man. By saying that he's good, he's not using it in the absolute sense. Only God is good in the absolute sense. But he's good in the sense of his reputation. He's good in the sense of his character. This is a man who is genuine. This is a man who is sincere. This is a man who is real, who seeks to live out his faith. And he is a just man. He is a righteous man. He is a right living man. It's Interesting to note as well, just a couple of verses or maybe four verses before, as Jesus is being crucified and finally gives up his spirit, the centurion is watching all of this unfold. And he says at the end of verse 47, certainly this was a righteous man. Speaking of Jesus, this was a righteous man. That same word is the word just that's used of this man Uh, Joseph, who will come and take the body of Jesus, that's the exact same word. But let me remind you that Jesus was just in his very nature. Joseph is just by the grace of God. He's also noted here as being a man who's waiting for the kingdom of God. He's a man who knew the scriptures, the Old Testament prophecies. He knew that there was a promised Messiah. He knew that the Messiah would bring his kingdom He understood his Bible. He knew what the Old Testament had to say. And again, when you're talking about his character, you have to think of some other people who were termed in similar words as being just or righteous or who were waiting for the salvation of God or for the kingdom of God, people like Zachariah and Elizabeth. You remember who their son is? It's John the Baptist, two very genuine, real followers of God who weren't just playing a part and who didn't just enjoy power, but they were living out their faith in a reality. There was also Simeon and Anna. Similar words are used about Simeon and Anna. You remember after the birth of Jesus, that they bring Jesus to the temple to do for him according to the law. Simeon first takes him and holds him up, but it's noted that that uh, Simeon is a a man of this kind of standing and of this kind of character. And then 
a woman who was a widow by the name of Anna comes in and sees this all unfolding. And she too is noted to be this kind of a person. Not everybody who was living in the day of Jesus was a hypocrite. Not everybody living in the day of Jesus was somebody who was just playing a part. There were people who genuinely believed God, and there were people who were genuinely following God. And one of those was a man by the name of Joseph from the city of Arimathea. You notice that it says here in this text that he had some property. That's one of the indicators that he was wealthy. But it says specifically about this tomb that it's a new tomb. Nobody has ever lain in it before, down in verse 53. No one has ever lain in this tomb before. You should know that one of the other gospel writers calls it a new tomb. And Matthew specifically says that Joseph is the one who had hewn out this tomb uh, with, his, with his own hands. Apparently, he may have had assistance, but he had done it himself. He had hewn out this tomb. But here's what's strange to this story for me. If Joseph lived a, a number of miles away from Jerusalem, why didn't he have a tomb closer to where he lived and closer to where his family lived? And if you were going to buy a piece of property and you were going to buy a, a place where you could create a tomb like this, why would you buy a piece of property that was so near to the execution grounds of the Romans. It wasn't just Jesus and these two criminals that were executed that day. There were hundreds and thousands, not all in this one spot called Golgotha, but there were hundreds and thousands of prisoners that were executed. And in my own mind, as I read through this account, I'm asking the question, Joseph, why buy it in Jerusalem? Well, we could say, well, he wants to be as close to the temple as possible and be buried there at death. That's possible. But why would you buy it so close to the execution grounds where Jesus would ultimately be crucified? Why would you buy it there? And I just want to ask a question. I don't have an answer to the question. But I just want to ask the question. Is it possible that Jesus had spoken to Joseph in advance of his crucifixion? And he had asked him to prepare a tomb for him. I can't prove that. That's just conjecture. It's just my thinking. Why would he buy a burial spot so close to the execution grounds of the Romans? And why would it be a burial ground so far from his home place and away from his own family? I don't know the answer to that question. But maybe, maybe Jesus and Joseph had talked about this tomb and that Jesus was going to need a tomb. And Joseph, therefore, having the means to be able to purchase this ground and cut this tomb, did so over a course of many months while Jesus is conducting his ministry. Because I want you to see next that this was a man of faith. At some point along the journey of Jesus' life in his ministry of those three and a half years, it says about this man that Jesus had become a disciple Excuse me, Joseph had become a disciple of Jesus. Do you find that interesting? Joseph had become a disciple of Jesus. L look for a moment with me back to John chapter 19. John chapter 19 and verse 38. This is just one of the pa passages that says this to us. Verse 38 of John 19. After this, Joseph of Arimathea being, here it is, a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Matthew says the same thing. He was a disciple of Jesus. Do you realize what that means? That means that this man who was a member of this religious ruling body at some point was convinced that Jesus is who he claimed to be, and he became a follower of Jesus Christ himself. But as the word secretly indicates, he remained in the shadows. He remained in the shadows. I don't think that this was the only one of these men who believed in Jesus. Uh, just for a moment, go back to chapter 12 of John. Just look over and notice on the occasion that they're getting ready to 
I crucified Jesus, but Jesus is prior to that crucifixion. And Jesus is speaking about his death. He's predicting his death. And notice what it says in verse 42 of John chapter 12. It says, nevertheless, even among the rulers, there's the phrase, even among the rulers, that would be Joseph, that would be Nicodemus, even among the rulers, many believed in him. Isn't that interesting? Amongst those 70 men plus the high priest, those who had been watching the ministry of, of Jesus, it only took 23 of them to convict Jesus and to send him to his condemnation, to his judgment on the cross. But many of them believed in him. In him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. It may well be that Joseph and Nicodemus were not the only two amongst this ruling body who had believed in Jesus, who had become followers of Jesus. But if there are only two, though John 12 says there were many of them that did, you understand that that's another authentication of the person of Christ as to who he is, that he is the Son of God, that he was who he claimed to be, that he did the things that he claimed to do. Because those most resistant to him, actually many of them apparently, became believers in Jesus, but they hid out like Joseph and Nicodemus. They hid out in the shadows because they were afraid of what people would say. He had become a disciple, and as John says, he had become a disciple, but secretly. Are we secret disciples? Are you a secret disciple? Are you one of those that's hiding out in the shadows rather than coming out into the light in, in saying, I declare my allegiance to Jesus Christ unashamedly? I identify with Jesus, and I want everyone to know that I'm his follower. Well, this man who had this tomb where there was a new grave cut back into a mountainside, had become a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, though he was doing it from a distance, and he was doing it in the shadows until, until the crucifixion. And there Jesus hung on that cross from about 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. that day, that Good Friday. He may have heard the words, actually one author says that it's possible that Nicodemus and Joseph were literally hiding in that tomb not far from the execution grounds just waiting till the death of Jesus came. But they saw him hanging on that cross and maybe they heard the things that Jesus had to, had to say from the cross but now he's given up his spirit and his body hangs lifeless on that cross, hardly recognizable as a human body. It was not unusual for the Romans to leave a body on the cross and allow the birds to fly and to pick at the body. As I said earlier, it wasn't unusual for them to take the bodies of these criminals down and to throw them into the city trash dump and let them be burned with the rest of the trash. But this man, Joseph, knew more about Jesus this man, Joseph, had put his faith in Jesus and was following Jesus at a distance and, sh and hiding out in the shadows. And this man, Joseph, could not allow the body of Jesus to be treated in that manner. And so he does something that could have easily cost him, extremely cost him. He goes to Pilate and he asks for the body of Jesus. That he has access to Pilate is an indicator that he's a man of power. Maybe his wealth, his body him access, maybe his work on the council of the Sanhedrin has bought him access to Pilate. But to go to Pilate and to ask for the body is a significant matter on this particular day, this Good Friday. Because in asking for the body of Jesus, he could have lost his reputation. 
The others of the council could have lost all confidence in him, could have written him off. He could have lost his position. He could have been put off of the council. He could have lost his power. He may well have lost his income as people began to learn that he was a follower of Jesus. They just cut him off and they stopped doing business with him and they stopped making it possible for him to be able to make a living and have an earning. He could have lost friendships. People who had been his devoted friend turned their backs on him and walked away. He could have even lost his life. He could have even lost his life. Listen to me. Isn't it interesting in Luke chapter 23 that Joseph is the only male disciple of Jesus, the only male disciple of Jesus to step forward in this chapter and to claim the body of Jesus? Hey, I don't know what your platform is, but if God gives you a platform... You don't hide your light under a bushel. You come out of the shadows and you use that platform to say, let me tell you about my relationship to Jesus Christ and how it's changed my life. And you do it whether you have a famous platform or not because you are a follower of Jesus. And Jesus left the glory and the majesty of heaven to come to us that we might be his children and we might have eternal life and the forgiveness of our sins and to live with him forever. How can we hide out in the shadows any longer? If you need to be baptized this morning, this is your time to step up and say, Pastor, one of our pastors, I need to follow Jesus in baptism and be unashamed of being identified as a follower of Christ. And if you've done that sometime in the past, it's time for all of us to step up and say, I'm a follower of Jesus. That's what defines me. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. That's what defines me. And I want everyone to know I'm not ashamed of that reality no matter what the cost is in doing so. Thanks for joining with us today, and we hope this message made a difference for you. If you'd like more information about today's message or Lewis Memorial Baptist Church, feel free to contact us. We'd love to hear how this ministry is helping you in your daily walk.